Ephesians 2 from verse 11 to the end. It says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate or separated or separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together and raised and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. Okay, so this morning we'll be thinking about this idea of being one in Christ, and it's what Ephesians is talking about. This, by the way, is not a small deal in the Bible. This, if anything, is the key mystery or hidden idea that actually Paul refers to quite often in the Bible. Where we came across it in Romans, and we're going to come across it now. And this is all stemmed out from Jesus or God's plan from the beginning to have people from all nations to be his family, to be all his children, okay, through Jesus. So, But the issue there at that time, back then, was that the Jewish people thought they were special. Unless you became one of the Jewish people, you were not allowed to to be able to worship God or not considered part of that covenant. He had to go in and follow very strict rules to become a Jew. And this is what Jesus came to fix once and for all time. It wasn't about traditions. It wasn't about rituals. It was about faith in the Savior of the world. And this is what Paul wants to bring out so clearly. It has so many implications to us today. It's unbelievable. In time would not be fair for us today because we have very limited time. Again, we're going to break bread together, so we need to um, get through this as short as possible, yet as concise as possible. So, uh, before everything, of course, uh, let me pray and start thinking about this. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for this revealed mystery. While there was mystery to the Jewish people back then, it's still a mystery to a lot of people today. Yet through your spirit, we know there's unity in Christ, that our ethnicity, our language, our cultures are not hindrance to you for bringing us together into the family, Father, the family of God, your family, Father, through the body of Christ. Amen. Okay, so a bit of an introduction. Okay, we go through Ephesians again. And as you know, Paul was sent out to whom? Paul was sent to the nations. He was, a, he was an apostle from God to the nations. But he always went, if you read the book of Acts, you know, Paul was a bit of a, I say royalty, but he was like, okay, Jesus said, go to the nations. Everywhere he went, where did he go first? To a Jewish synagogue. <laughs> he always went to his own people. But within these synagogues, okay, or synagogues, whatever, there were Gentiles, there were people who were not Jewish, who were keen to know about God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they would come to him, and they would listen, and they hear for the first time ever 
for the first time ever that a Greek, a Roman, an Assyrian, a Chinese, a Vietnamese, anybody, an Arab, can all become members of the Israel of God. Some Jewish people, by faith, loved the idea. Some Jewish people who didn't have faith hated the idea. How can we be mixed with these Gentiles, unclean people? But Jewish who understood the idea, they know that Christ died, and by his blood we are all declared righteous. And the promises to Abraham was the promises to all nations. It wasn't just for the people of Israel. Okay? So... Today, we're going to think about this, however, in our context today, I'll give you a couple of things, but let's ask this question today. Today, we see that there are many denominations in the Christian world, right? There's Roman Catholics, there's the flavors of Orthodox, even within Roman Catholic, by the way, there's many flavors in there. Within Orthodox, there are many flavors, and we have Protestants, and there are many flavors, okay? But we're not talking about the heretical sects, like those who are completely and utterly not Christian, like the uh, Mormons or, or Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they're just not Christian, they're just not put them into the same category. But within those who believe the basics, if you think about the Nicene Creed and what we confess even today, okay, within these, there are many denominations. So, having many denominations, does that indicate that the body of Christ is divided? Does the existence of numerous Christian denominations indicate a division within the body of Christ? Believe it or not, many Christians who call themselves Christians would say yes. I would argue absolutely, positively not. <laughs> and we're going to try and figure this out as we go through Ephesians. So let's go through the three points can help us answer this question and also extend the applications of this to other situations we see in the world today. For example, um, okay, one of the three points are, apologies, it's this unity, this unity is not done by human hands. This unity is not done by human hands. It's made between Jews and Gentiles, so there's no more two groups but one, and this one body is that has the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in it. It's a body that's made not by human hands, that unites Jew and Gentiles to become the residing place, the place where the Spirit of God dwells in. And it's an amazing mystery. It's an amazing gift. You know, if Christian understood this and lived this way, this world would be very different. Let's think about this a little bit more. Not by human hands. See, back then, the Jewish people thought, for you to be a Jew, you either be born in a Jewish community, and even then, if you were a boy and you are born in that Jewish community, on the eighth day after you were born, you had to be circumcised. A ritual by human hands had to be done, which is something that God commanded Abraham and then Moses to do. And through that, Moses said, through this ritual, okay, you initiate, you initiate the person into our community. So every male had to be circumcised to be a member of the Jewish people. Okay. Now, this one thing, if you were a foreigner who came in to live and to worship God of Israel, he wanted to be part of that community. If you were male, you had to be circumcised, you had to go through all the rituals. Okay. If you were not part of the community of Israel, you were given one title, unclean. You are unclean. You can't be part of us. You most definitely will go nowhere near our holy of holies, our holy worship place. You cannot have a meal with us during time of celebrations. You are a foreigner. It was demanded by God on the Jewish people to look after foreigners, to look after them amazingly, it was God's command, because God reminded Jewish people that they were foreigners in Egypt and God saved them, so they have to look after foreigners and not to treat foreigners in a bad way. But to be a Jew, you had to go through these rituals, otherwise you were 
unclean. Always unclean. Okay, and that was the issue. And here's the thing. Today, you go to a Roman Catholic church, and again, I'm not talking about them as an aggressor. I'm just, it's a, more of a, a an observation, if I may use that word. You know, if you go to a Roman Catholic church, they have all these rituals you have to do. You have to do these rituals. If you go to an Orthodox church, they have other rituals you have to do. And if you don't do them, you're not following the rules. You're not really a Christian. I mean, the, the ones who know within Roman Catholicism, the, one, the ones who really know God through uh, through a, an Orthodox, and there are Christians in these groups, by the way, individuals, they know it's all by faith. It's not by what you do. But the institutions demand that you have to follow the rules. If you want to get married to a Roman Catholic, you have to be baptized by a Roman Catholic. It's like, are you serious? What's wrong with that baptism? If you were to go to Baptist church, you have to go to the Baptist church before you become a member of the church. Not everyone hold on to that truth, but then you see what happens. You see the divisions. You see that rituals, traditions, become the thing that separates people from people. And God's saying, no, it's not. Remember that formally, you who are Gentiles by birth and call circumcised, one circumcised apologies, by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is made by human hands. Remember that time? It separated you from anything that was broke. It separated you. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded. I mean, honestly, if the Savior of the world comes in, he's God in the flesh, lives a perfect life on your behalf. Fulfills the whole entire law requirement and says, for you, it is done already. Dies for your pain, you're dead before God. And he's risen. And he sits at the right hand of God. If you believe all of that, and then come to say to people, oh, you can't be part of our family because there's something we haven't done. I mean, are you serious? And this is what was happening. Jews who did not believe in what Paul was teaching, persecuted Paul so much, he suffered out of their hands more than anybody else. Again, don't forget, Paul was a Jew, was a Pharisee, was a highly educated Jewish person. He knew the law, he knew the Torah, but he met the risen Jesus and that truly transformed his life and his understanding of the Old Testament. They were using this to break, to break people apart. But God, of course, overcame, overcame this by his own hands, okay? But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, not by your works, not by your sacrifices, but by the sacrifice that God offered for you by offering his son, Jesus. It is God who offered his son, Jesus, a sacrifice for you. Remember these words are not Paul's words. These words are coming from whom? It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He's an apostle from God, okay, from Jesus, by the will of God. He's, he's given a message, and this is the message. There's no only or two, there's one. If you believe in Christ, you are one. No more Jew and Gentile. No more Israelis and non-Israelis. You either are his people or you're not his people. So he speaks of things that Jesus already spoke about. He's not bringing something new. So God made peace between Jews and Gentiles, okay, not because it was an accident, not because it was something that just happened after Jesus so happened to go up to heaven. No, this was Jesus' plan from the beginning. Jesus told him what he was going to do. He says in John chapter 10, verse 16, this is Jesus talking to the Jewish authorities. He goes, I have other sheep. I have other sheep. Okay? That are not of this flock. They're not of this hen. Okay? They're not from you. There's other sheep I have. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will already listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock, one shepherd. One flock, 
one shepherd, one body, one faith, one baptism, one belief, one spirit, one God. And they said, there's no, no foundation for any Christian or Jew today to say, no, there's two or three or four or five. It's impossible. Just because we disagree, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean that we are able to tear asunder, tear apart the body of Christ. There's no power that exists outside of God that can split him apart. It just doesn't happen. He, we are one. Jesus said it. I will bring him in and they will be one. If you watch the war today in Gaza, in the Middle East, Jewish, non-Christian, they're not Christians, okay? Remember, most of them don't even believe in God anymore. Remember what happened? It was during the whole day of Sukkot. Sukkot is the day, it's, it's a week actually, when they remember God's his mystery, that he, God took him out of Egypt to bring him to the promised land. Because when he got into the promised land, and when I promised to you, remember how I did that by giving you cover over you. Leading you by the cloud in the morning, pillar of cloud in the morning, pillar of fire at night, providing for you. You would remember this once a year, but in a week, you live outside your home in a tent. Remember that. Remember the Bible I gave you. Remember my promise to you. Yet some Jewish people on that day, you know what they were doing? They were celebrating paganism that day. It's heart wrenching. When you see the people of God, people call themselves Israelis, people who associate themselves with the struggle with God, Israel means struggle with God, to wrestle with God, doing this. We see Muslims, on the other hand, coming from a demonic religion that denies the goodness of Christ, that denies the goodness of God, denies that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, attributes things that are false, that God had a relationship, a sexual relationship to Mary and then gave birth to a, a son called Jesus. These are unbiblical things that they, is what they believe and they attribute these wrong things to us. And they are Jews, Muslims, are each other's neck all the time. When is it going to end? What do you think the solution is? What do you think? For well, he, Jesus himself, is our peace. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What is this dividing wall of us here that Jesus destroyed and made the two groups into one? Religion. In the Old Testament, we had um, what we call the, the law. Okay? And Jesus didn't come to demolish the law. He came to fulfill the law on behalf of the Jew and the Gentile. Okay? Do not think I have come to abolish the law, Jesus said, all the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He completed everything necessary for you and me to be right with God. Everything is necessary is already done. Okay, so today, I live this one. I live knowing that I am saved because Christ has done everything that I need to be saved. Everything. See, the law was a problem. In the Muslim world, we have the Sharia. The Sharia is the Islamic laws. Okay, um, and in that law of Islam, anything that goes against it has to be destroyed. If you're not submitting, it's a religion of submissiveness. If you don't submit to their God, to their Sharia, to their law, you are an enemy. An enemy that could be killed or persecuted, or if you're Christian and Jew, subjugated unto heavy taxes and treated really badly. That's their, that's their religion. They don't see it. If you're a Jewish person back then, not today, in the Old Testament, you couldn't be part of their nations unless you did everything they themselves failed to do. In the Bible, the Old Testament is clear and how often they failed and what God did to try and correct them. Okay? But Jesus put it all away. Because Jesus, by setting aside in his flesh the law, with his commands and regulations, 
His purpose, God's purpose, Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. You want peace in the Middle East? Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus is the only one that can truly transform these people's life, both sides. You want unity in the Christian body? Preach Jesus and remind them that he is the one who's done everything necessary for us to be right with God. Jesus, in him, and nothing else. And in one body, to reconcile both of them, Jews and Gentiles, to God through the cross, through his suffering, through his death. Remember, we were outside the cross, and then we are in the family because of the cross, by which he put to death their hostility, their hatred, their violence against each other. He put to death all of that. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near the Jewish people. You want peace in the Middle East? You want children from Arab nations, from Jewish nations to stop dying? You want women to be, to, to be protected and walked away from both parties? He's the solution. Nobody else is. And why? Or how? Are we able to live that way in peace? is because we are now the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The body, Jew or Gentile. You've asked a Jew, why did God, your God, destroy the temple 2,000 years ago? Why did he destroy the temple just right after a guy called Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah, came? Why? Didn't Jesus say, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days? So why did God destroy the earthly temple made by hands, human hands? For through him, this Christ, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one spirit. Again, why is he saying that? Because we are built on the same foundations that built by God. God is the one who's touched the real religion, the real faith, okay? Mm -hmm. This is, again, nothing new. What Paul is teaching is nothing new. Everything he's saying is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Everything he did was exactly what Jesus was saying before. So these things are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, again, it's, it's not new. Everything he's talking about is there. That's why he was amazed to see it all the time. He goes, look at Isaiah. Isaiah talks about, you know, this is what the sovereign law says. I will, so let me read here, goes, say, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a, that's Jesus, of course, a precious cornerstone for sure, for a sure foundation, the one who lies on it will never be stricken with panic. Another one is Zechariah. He says, from Judah, not any other tribe, okay, just like Jesus came from Judah, from Judah will come the cornerstone. For him, from him, the tent peg, from him, the battle boat, from him, every ruler. And that's why, that's why God had no need anymore for an earthly temple. The cornerstone he established is his son, Jesus. The foundation he built is his son, faith in him through his spirit. And that's why he brought all of us together to be one, a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We are the members of Christ. We all have the Holy Spirit. We are his body, his temple. I'm sorry, I'm rushing through this. Um, so what? Does the existence of numerous Christian denominations indicate a division within the body of Christ? I'm hoping you know now the answer is no, it doesn't. No way, because the body of Christ is one, it's not divided. The body of Christ is not determined by the denomination. The body of Christ is determined by God and those whom he draws from all nations to be his children through his spirit. Not by what we say, but what by what he has done. Okay, let's pray.
actually before that, I thought I had the salmon. Um, oh, sorry, salmon salmon. So to finish off, this is the, the main idea that I had for this whole session. Through Christ, God has united diverse, multiple, numerous groups of people into a single community that embodies the living body of Christ, serving as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ, we are one. Okay, thanks. Father God, we thank you for Ephesians. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for what you have done through him to bring us together into unity, into the body of Christ. We ask you, Father, please, um, to allow many Christians to know these things and to go out and to preach it to Jew and to Gentile, for them to know the great love you have for your people and the perfect gift you provided uh, for them to be made right with you through your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. So I'm going to skip the song because we're out of time. Let's do the Lord's Supper together.